All right. Well, it is just a minute past our time, so let's go ahead and jump right in today. Um, thanks again for joining us today for the fourth installment of our AV++ webinars from Mad Systems. Today's webinar will cover recognition technologies. I'm Brandi Alvarado, Business Development Manager for Mad Systems, and I'll be one of your hosts today. Also joining me today is Jessica Bill, who will be joining us from the Mad Lab for a live demo of our recognition technologies later on during the webinar. Oops, one second here. Bear with me. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping. We welcome all your questions today, so please feel free to use the Q&A or chat panels for any questions you might have. We'll be taking the last 10 minutes of the session to address them. Also, please note for this webinar, we are recording it and it will be available tomorrow to share amongst your colleagues. For those of you unfamiliar with Un uh, MAD Systems, we are an award-winning technology company specializing in audiovisual systems integration and interactive exhibits. We use the latest technology when designing AV systems using non-proprietary equipment whenever possible to create long-lasting and easy-to-maintain technology for museums, visitor centers, and theme parks. Our extraordinary toolkit <clears throat> goes well beyond the basic needs of AV and our fully equipped mechanical workshop allows us to produce exhibits from simple support structures to complex devices such as uh, ORIs, earthquake simulators, and moving mechanical special effects. I attended a webinar recently and it talked about how safe it was to use touchscreens as long as there was a hand sanitizer station nearby. Really? Show of hands. How many of you think that's really safe? Consider this. Do you think everyone washes their hands? Maybe more now. And if they truly wash their hands, how many of you think that they will use a hand sanitizer station before touching a screen? And how many of you think that they will use it after as well? Also consider this. If this is really truly used correctly and as it's intended, and someone does use the hand sanitizer station before touching a display, don't you think at some point in time, this display might become damaged or at the very, very least, a bit grody? Total cost of ownership of a solution like this is really off the charts. You still have to have staff clean this regularly. This is what I call the yuck factor. Let me be clear and say that we're not trying to incite fear. We're simply offering options for a contactless and safer interactive experience through our recognition technologies. So let's explore some of the possibilities with facial recognition technology. Mad Systems has filed a patent for facial recognition media delivery. We believe that this technology is truly 21st century AV and will revolutionize the guest experience. Let me paint you a picture. You and your lovely family decide to take a visit to a museum. You've got mom, dad, grandpa, and two kids. Mom's an elementary school teacher, God bless her. <laughs> the two kids are about four years apart. Grandpa's from the old country and prefers to speak in Italian, and he's also a bit hard of hearing. And dad, well, he's along for the ride. <laughs> Clearly a diverse family, as many are, with different knowledge bases, language preferences, and challenges. So how can this family possibly enjoy this museum together? We believe facial recognition is one way to make an exceptional and shared experience for all of them. So this family heads to the museum. To utilize a facial recognition system, they need to register. They can do so by submitting headshots when they buy tickets online or at the venue by way of docent or a kiosk. They take a quick picture and answer a few questions and they're on their way receiving tailored content suited to their preferences. But we'll get to that in just a second. The same group can also choose to go in anonymously and not register. And at the first interactive, when it does not recognize this patron, it will ask for a few quick bits of information. The system may want to ask things about your age, your uh, range of, of, of or grade level. It can also ask things about your language preference, content preferences. Maybe you want more of a science background versus a, a historical account of that particular instance. Um, it'll all also ask questions with regards to ADA, a hearing or a visual impairment. From there on out, the content is conveyed in your selected preferences. This allows us to customize media for certain audiences. Like with our museum family, mom, dad, the kids, and grandpa will all receive custom content based on their registration preferences. With facial recognition, this family will also receive a more personalized experience, having content delivered to them in their desired language preferences 
and content based on their education levels, kids level versus an adult level uh, uh, of content. Our facial recognition system also addresses ADA and it's handled without changes to the aesthetics. Turn on subtitles in your language in the way you want to see it, turn up the volume for grandpa who's hard of hearing, or turn on high contrast media, or even add buttons for ADA help for those who are disabled. Buttons can be dropped down for easier access. And again, all based on facial recognition. Membership is also easily handled through facial recognition. Members can opt in and have data saved for easier return visits. And then based on their preferences, they can be given the VIB experience that they deserve. Remember, data is only saved if they opt in. Data is kept locally, not on a cloud, and scrubbed nightly to ensure privacy. Here's an example of something we have run, running in our lab. Um, we can change the content of the video depending on the audience. We also have automatic subtitle interface. We have a bunch of actors that we put in front of the camera and we can change languages based on their facial recognition patterns or based on pre-registered preferences. Here we have a picture of Eric Clapton and what you'll get is a video of Eric playing, which we'll kind of demonstrate a little later on during the, the demo. Um, many people ask, how quick is recognition? The time it takes between someone being in front of the camera and the action command to take place is between 300 and 700 milliseconds. Our system responds in less than a second, which is faster than it would take to send the information out on the cloud or to a provider such as Google or Amazon or Microsoft. <clears throat> Another question we often get asked is about privacy. So let me address the big pink elephant in the room right now. The data is kept, um, the data that is kept by facial recognition system is encrypted vectors, much like what you see here on the slide. <clears throat> um, it identifies significant aspects of the face, uh, things like, you know, uh, numbers and geometry of your face, as well as other parameters, as you can also see in this slide. The system then scrubs the data collected nightly and does not need an internet link, sorry, if there's a concern for privacy. Yeah, you are reading this correctly. We are currently working on an iteration of our recognition technologies to include uh, when folks are wearing a mask. That's in development currently and will be available in the very near future, so stay tuned for that. Let's also talk about data. Think about how valuable data is to your business. If you're a museum or an entertainment venue, wouldn't you like to know the age ranges most visiting your venue? Or how about what exhibits or attractions are getting the most dwell time or the opposite, not getting much attention at all? Or how about how many times a member has visited a certain attraction or exhibit? Or whether somebody is smiling or what, what type of interaction that they're having with an attraction? There's lots of valuable data that can be collected and used to improve the customer experience and journey. It's just really the tip of the iceberg. Our facial recognition media delivery options can be fitted to a range of hardware configurations as well. The most flexible of which is our Quicksilver system, which is specifically designed for recognition systems in mind. Not a lot of infrastructure or cable is needed as, as you can see through this diagram. The facial recognition cameras only need a Cat5 or 6 cable added. Another thing to note is that there's no internet connection needed at all. So information can be kept on a computer and locked in a cabinet. If facial recognition is unacceptable for some reason, we also have an alternative, color recognition. We noticed a number of school groups and clubs having something in common when they visit a museum. In this school group case, they all have on red hats. So we developed a way to cater to these groups by way of color and pattern recognition system. Much like the facial recognition system, color recognition can also tailor content. The granularity is less, but we know if you're wearing a red hat that you're going to be between seven and eight years old, and therefore we can tailor content with that in mind. Um, or we can give you a lanyard with a bright green tag on it for someone who has a hearing problem, or perhaps a purple one for someone who has a visual impairment. We can do all of those things and tailor the content accordingly to meet ADA compliance. Think of ADA now. Currently, we have to design for that one one thousandth of the population. With facial recognition, you don't have to do that. You simply let the system know and it'll tailor the content in a suitable fashion based on those needs. Another patent we have is for license plate recognition, controlled media, and interactive delivery system. So what does that mean exactly? 
That patent applies to any system that delivers media based on data from a license plate recognition system. We love a good story, so let me tell you a little bit about how this works. Imagine it's a sunny day and you're pulling up to a gas station. You'll likely be engaged with a display showing ads for the latest soft drinks, chips, or beers to buy inside. Digital out of home folks, <clears throat> or DOOH folks, are taking that a step further and embedding a camera into the display to capture your facial responses to those ads, as well as your license plate information. It's that correlation between your vehicle and where the digital signage content magic happens. Maybe you smile when that beer ad comes up and think to yourself, boy, I could really use a cold one right now. But alas, you're on a road trip and heading down the highway, so no time for that beer just yet. But uh, you fill up, you jump back in your vehicle, you turn on your favorite playlist and hit the highway. You're cruising along and sometime later you notice a billboard in the distance with that beer that you just smiled at back at the gas station. Yeah, but wait, how did they know? By peering technologies like digital signage, facial recognition, license plate correlation and behavioral sensing with dynamic content, mobile integrations and data analysis, math systems can truly um, show you one of the best ways to advertise by engaging and targeting content that people can interact with. Same goes for your favorite fast food or coffee shop. Math Systems has developed this patent that can recognize a car when it arrives and can recognize its drivers and passengers and correlate that information with the car. If the car comes through the drive-through on a regular basis and is ordering the same beverages, why not put a message on the order screen that says, good morning, Fred, would you like your usual latte? Flash your lights. Personalize the welcome, recognize past orders, and put a smile on the customer's face. It's all possible through license plate recognition and correlation. Our system could correlate cars with their drivers and passengers, personalizing experiences and delivering personalized messages that are both obvious applications that will excite and revitalize a market that is not seeing anything revolutionary for some time now. At the end of the day, making the customer experience seamless, unique, and effortless is the wave of the future. Now, what you've all been waiting for, a sneak peek at our recognition technologies. I'm gonna hand this presentation over to Jessica now, and she'll show you a live demonstration of our recognition technologies. After that, I'll meet you back here for the Q&A, so please remember to use the Q&A or chat panel to pose your questions. Take it away, Ms. Jessica. Hello, everyone, and welcome to MAD Systems. My name is Jessica, and I'm going to be doing the demonstration portion of today's webinar. We have several facial recognition demonstrations to show you today, and you'll notice I did remove my mask. But as Brandy mentioned, soon we will be able to also recognize people who are wearing any type of face covering. So that's on the way. Also, a lot of the concepts that you're gonna see with our facial recognition demos can be applied in a way to our color recognition and our license plate recognition solutions. So keep that in mind as we go around. And if you guys do have any questions, please put that in the Q&A section so that Brandy can get to those following this demonstration. So when we began developing our facial recognition technology, we knew we wanted to use it as a tool for personalization and inclusion. So the way that we set that up is by having users register prior to their experience. So that could be at a kiosk when they first enter a museum. It could be with a QR code that they scan and register from the safety of their own device or they could also do it in advance from home, maybe online when they purchase a ticket or something like that. So when they're registering, they can put in a bunch of different personal preferences, like do they have any special needs that would require ADA accommodations? Also, what is their language preference? And what is the most appropriate content to deliver to them? Is this a toddler without reading capabilities? Is it a child in elementary school or high school? or is it a scholar or professional? All of these things affect how we would deliver a message to an individual. And so we want to be able to serve more than one type of audience. I'm going to begin in here by showing you the basics of how our facial recognition system works, which is recognizing people in a space. That's the first step. So if I face this over here, it's going to display my name in my photo up there to show you guys that it is recognized. 
So we're, we can set the system up so that we can either just recognize actual living people in the space, or we can also set it up so that it'll recognize still images or photos, which comes in handy when, you know, for obvious reasons, there aren't a lot of people in the office today to help me demonstrate how we can recognize multiple people here. So I actually asked uh, the Queen of England and Gavin Lisa and Tom Hanks to join me today, but they weren't able to make it. So I have their photos here. <laughs> so we're going to show them coming up to the exhibit with me. So I'll stand here first by myself. And there I am. The exhibit's seeing me here. And now I'm going to have these three folks join me. So it pulls them up. And now I also have the cast of Parks and Recreation. They're going to join me at the exhibit too. And so as it recognizes all of us, it will pull their names up onto the screen to show you everyone in this space. And then once someone uh, goes away from the exhibit and it can't detect them anymore, they will disappear after a couple of seconds. It'll make sure that they're definitely gone and then it'll go away. So this is to give you an idea of how we can recognize multiple people in the space. But then once we know those people are there, how do we decide how to deliver messages based on that group of people? Well, we would work with the client in advance to set up default settings for the exhibits. And then we would also be able to set parameters for say if there's 50% of the people in front of the exhibit, they share a preferred language then we can have the exhibit display or play the audio in that language. If we wanted to prioritize ADA requirements, we could do that. Also, if we wanted to say, at this certain ratio of children to adults, we wanna make sure we play the children's or the adults version of the content. And now Brandy mentioned the security of this system, and I just wanna reiterate that. So our system does not need to store images of anyone in it. Instead, we, when we put the photos into the system, we store it as encrypted vectors, which basically just describes someone's face. It's a set of measurements and numbers, and even if someone did decrypt it, they wouldn't really be able to recreate someone's image from that. Also, we don't require an internet connection for this system, so the computer can be put away in a locked cabinet. And we can also program the system to scrub at the end of the night so that no information is stored from one day to the next. So that is the basics of our recognition. And now I'm going to take you into the lab where we're going to get a little more into what makes our recognition technology different from maybe the recognition technology that you use to unlock your phone or recognition systems that basically just tell you who somebody is. So what we have is patent-pending facial recognition-based media delivery, which means that somebody can come in front of an exhibit and we know who that person is, but now we can also say, based on who's in front of this exhibit, I want to deliver a certain kind of information to them. So this is set up to demonstrate to you how we can deliver media that's geared towards these individuals. So if I take one of these photos, I have Beyonce here, and I hold it up. She's just come up to the exhibit. And there's her in one of her music videos. And now here's Neil Armstrong. He's gonna come up and there's a little moonwalking. And then we have Meryl Streep. and George Clooney. And we have Rod Stewart. So as you can see, the time that it takes from the person arriving to the exhibit to when the media is delivered is very quick. It only takes between 300 to 700 milliseconds from the time of interaction to the time of delivery. And that's a lot faster than if we were to send this information out to a third party like Microsoft or Apple or Google or something like that. It's much quicker to do with our system. Now, another 
think another way that I like to think of using this system is in a retail setting. So for example, I love salt and vinegar chips, so much so I will buy them anywhere I see them. And if I were to frequent the same gas station or grocery store, they would definitely know this about me. So they could flip up a video or an image of some salt and vinegar chips and say, hey, did you know these are in aisle seven? Or we actually have those two for five today. Or hey, here's a dollar off coupon. That's targeted advertising at its finest. Now I'm going to show you our language and subtitle station. So I showed these last week when we were doing our touchless technology webinar, and I showed how we can use a QR code. Anyone with a smart device could come up to an exhibit, they could scan the QR code, and then they would be able to pull the controls up from the safety of their own device. They'd be able to choose different languages or subtitles from these controls. But another way that we can use this and the way we originally set it up was using a facial recognition trigger. So obviously that's what I'm going to demonstrate for you today. Now these are running on our Quicksilver system and we can program up to a couple hundred different languages or subtitles and be able to switch between those. So I'm going to go ahead and have Che Guevara come up to this exhibit and we'll change to some Spanish subtitles for him. In there that's changed live right over to the Spanish subtitles. And now we'll switch over to some Dutch subtitles. I have this uh, actor Rutger Hauer. So there we've changed to Dutch subtitles for him. And now we have this Persian woman it's going to give her Arabic subtitle. And now, as you can see, the system has no problem subtitling languages with non-Latin alphabets. And then we have the queen, who, of course, prefers English. So as I told you, all of these changes happen live without interrupting the video feed at all. But if you did want to program it so that the video restarts when somebody approaches the exhibit and has a language change, you can do it that way well as well, um, whatever makes the most sense for the exhibit. So we're going to do the same thing with languages. This one is going to be the audio that the presenter is speaking in. So he's, he's speaking in English right now. Now I'm going to have Che Guevara come back up so we can get Spanish. So there the audio has changed. Now we'll go back to Arabic. That's the Arabic subtitles. And now I'm going to go back to Dutch. But I actually have two different photos of the same person. This is the one that I used before. He's much younger in this photo. And we actually have a bunch of photos of him at all different ages because we wanted to see how the system would react to the changes in somebody's face over time. But it turns out, through our experimentation, we found that the cardinal points on a person's face do not change that much with age. So the vectors that our system uses to recognize an individual pretty much stays the same over time. So I'm going to use this photo of Rupert Hauer when he's much older. We only have one reference photo in the system, and we're still able to recognize him. And so there is the Dutch language for you. And of course, we have the Queen who likes English. So we're back to English. We live in a global world more so than ever, so it's really important to try and target every audience that we can, especially if museums, visitor centers, and theme parks are in urban areas with diverse populations, and a lot of these places also draw visitors from all around the globe. I'm going to go over here and show you our dual graphics panel. This is another um, exhibit that I have demonstrated before. I did it in our very first webinar for Quicksilver, but 
I saved the actual demonstration portion for today since it's facial recognition based. So we would typically be projecting this display and because of space limitations, we're showing it on a monitor here. But we have two graphics panels side by side. They're running on one server, they're on one display, but they're both individually controllable. And we can actually have up to four different graphics panels on the same display on the same server. So when we're talking about projectors and you only need one projector where you would typically otherwise need four projectors, that's a significant cost savings. And so we're to the point where projected graphics are not that much more expensive than fixed graphics. And with all of the added benefits too, it's so valuable because you don't have to get stuck with fixed graphics that could go out of date, you know, within a couple of years after putting your exhibit up. And also modern audiences are used to dynamic graphics. That's kind of their norm. And this system can match that because we can use dynamic graphics created with something even as easy as PowerPoint. So we're able to create exhibits that can be more exciting and more interesting for modern audiences. So I'm going to demonstrate how we can switch the language on these using our facial recognition trigger. It'll change to a different language based on the individual that I'm gonna hold up in front of it. But it's only going to change on one side versus the other because like I said, they're individually controllable. So we have Angela Merkel here. It's going to change to German for her, and she's going to go over to this exhibit. So there it's only changed that one side, the side she's on. And now I have Fidel Castro. He's going to come over this side, and he's got Spanish up there for him. So this is what I mean when I say that they're individually controllable. It's only changing the language on one side at a time without affecting the other side at all. Now we're going to change over to Russian here. And now we have Tom Hanks back. He's going to visit here, change over to English. And now he's going to walk over to the other one as well. And we'll get back to English there as well. So as you can see, this is a really flexible solution and we're always thinking of new ideas, new ways to implement this technology. If you guys have any ideas of your own or questions about how this can be used, we would love to hear about it. So please get in touch with us. We love thinking about new ways to use this technology. I wanna thank you guys for joining me for this demonstration. Uh, we do have more demonstrations coming up in our future webinars. Next week's webinar is going to be on our patented uh, facial recognition application called Looking Glass Concierge. So please make sure that you register for that one next Tuesday. And now we're going to go back over to Brandy for our Q&A. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate that very, very much. Let me go back to my little slide deck here. Bear with me one second. Alrighty, so again, please use <clears throat> the Q&A panel or the chat panel to pose any questions you might have. We will be joined by Maris in just a quick second um, to field and help me field some of those questions. So um, I did notice, uh, let's see, oh, no, nothing in the chat panel at the moment. Um, again, we're really excited to bring you this technology and um, to show you a live demonstration of what we've got running in our lab currently. We're open to any suggestions, as Jessica mentioned, um, so please let us know if there's any ideas that you have for, per, for um, various applications. As you can see, we've been joined by Maris. Um, Maris, we don't really have any questions at the moment. Is there anything that we didn't cover that you want to throw out there in terms of facial recognition? No, I think you guys have pretty well said it all. I think the big announcement today um, for us is the fact that uh, this technology, which we've had up and running now for the uh, best part of two years, um, has got to the point where very shortly we'll be able to handle people with masks on so that uh, even the current status of the world will not stop us from being able to deploy this as, a, as an other touchless uh, method of controlling exhibits. 
Um, and I think that uh, when you look at uh, uh, facial recognition, in addition to the, te uh, the touchless technologies that we presented last week, you will see that there are ways of creating a normal environment and a normal set of interactive capabilities to an AV system for um, you know even going forward with the uh, with the current situation. So we're really happy that we've uh, put an enormous amount of effort into, uh, into moving forward and making sure that we're ready for, um, for whatever comes next. Um, and if there are no other questions, then both of you just did a fantastic job as usual. So nope, I have nope. nothing to add. <laughs> we've got questions, hold on. <laughs> Don't go anywhere yet. <laughs> oh, all right. Okay, so um, one of the questions is, how is the front door introductory kiosk linked to the museum exhibits? Well, it, so we are showing it as a demo station. And really what we have been testing there is um, how many people we can recognize at any given time. And it's an awful lot of them because the plan with the multiple people recognition is that we could, for example, if you walk people into a theater, we can decide whether to use the Spanish version with English subtitles or the English version with Spanish subtitles, depending on the mix of people we have. Or we can say, hey, there's a whole bunch of kids in this audience, let's, uh, let's run the kid version. Um, so that gives us a level of flexibility that uh, you would otherwise have to, have to take care of manually somehow, and half the time you wouldn't know how to make that selection. So, it isn't, it, it's coupled to the same facial recognition system that we're running in the lab. Um, but otherwise, it really is for our testing purposes and for our setup purposes um, that we have that, uh, we have that running in the lobby. And because the lobby is the best space, because that's where we get people walking in and out all the time um, until, uh, until, the far, until the last couple of months. <laughs> um, we would normally pre-program pre people in. And then the other thing that we, um, we have is that our front door will actually also recognize people and unlock itself for people that it recognizes, which would be uh, staff and customers we're expecting and people like uh, the UPS and the uh, postal delivery people. Um, who normally in the past, um, basically the door would unlock so that they could walk in. Perfect. Um, another question is, do we partner with any specific companies as far as interactive monitors? Not particularly. Um, I mean, we, so we, Mad, Mad Systems as a company specifically does not have any fixed relationship. And the reason for that is that we believe that we should always have to have the freedom to select whatever equipment we feel is the best option for any given client. Um, so we, we're pretty agnostic when it comes to our equipment selection. The biggest thing is quality. Um, we just want high quality devices for everything that we do so that we know that we don't have to, um, we don't have to worry about things failing um, or things misbehaving. Um, and that really is, is our, our, our primary concern with most of the designs and most of the implementation that, that, we, uh, that we do as a company. Perfect. This kind of segues into the next question. How flexible is the camera choice? Well, we select the cameras. Um, it has to be something that we are happy with. And so we've done a lot of experiments with a lot of different cameras. And to some extent, it depends on the application. In other words, what level of contrast do you have? What level of lighting do you have? Do you have fluorescent or LED? It does make a difference. Um, it isn't huge, but um, our guys basically are forever looking at cameras and trying different um, solutions in order to get the best possible result. So remember that all of this for us uh, relates to installed systems. And the cameras that we have been using are either USB um, or they are uh, PoE surveillance type of cameras. So it's nothing, it's nothing out of the ordinary in terms of um, what we need. It really is application dependent more than anything. Just making sure that we can get the quality of the result that we want. Perfect. 
Another question is, um, how do we populate the database for recognition? So there's, there's four ways of doing that. Um, the first one is that um, if we look at the time sequence kind of thing, you could do it at home. So if a museum or a venue or a membership program or a gas station um, chain, whoever, if they wanted to do a web page where you can register and it can take a picture of you and you're okay with that, if you want to opt in, that is one way of doing it. So you can do it from home. Um, the second way of doing it is that we can have um, kiosks in a museum or other venue. And so you can um, opt in as you want. Um, there is, by the way, what we call anonymous recognition, whereby, um, which is kind of the third way. So if you walk into a museum, you decided you didn't want to opt in with any kind of information about you then you could still get to the point where we can you come to the first interactive and we can say hey which language would you like i don't know who you are i've never seen you before um is there a language preference you have and you could say sure i prefer english and from there on in when it sees your face even though it knows nothing about you it would give you an english language preference or if you are you know i don't know a 10 year old uh, you would indicate that you're in that age group and you're going to get kids specific materials. So we have ways of doing that too. And then the, um, the fourth way is that we can have um, staff members uh, with roaming devices when it gets really busy and they can um, obviously register you in the system as well. What we do in the office um, is that if we know that we have clients coming in, we'll either ask for pictures, or if we don't have time to do that, we might look up on LinkedIn. Um, and uh, even with the, uh, with the pictures from LinkedIn, we could actually recognize people and welcome them by name when they, uh, when they get to our office. And we can do that in two ways. We can do it on the screen, as you saw where Jessica um, showed you that in the lobby entry. Um, but on the door opener, we're actually doing that with one of our um, digital audio repeaters, um, uh, the randomizers, and that has text-to-speech built in. So, for example, if I open the door, um, it, uh, if I get to the door and it recognizes me, it'll open the door for me and say, hey, boss, you're late again. But equally well, we can recognize people by their name by just sending it a text string and welcoming people by name when they get to the front door. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's perfect. Okay, um, one more question. Um, it says, I may have missed this, but how long does a viewer or person have control of watching a video in their language before someone else wanders in front of a monitor and also wants to watch it in their own language? So if we see that people are still watching, then we'll lock in their language. So if I, if I walk up and I've indicated that I prefer Dutch, which I don't, but if I did, um, it would, and I'm the first person to walk up, it would change, or it could change, I should say, depending on how you've programmed it. It could change to the Dutch language while I'm still looking, and maybe a couple of seconds after I stop looking, it will continue running that Dutch language. Now, if a second person walks up who has an English preference, we would go and we can program it to run English subtitles while it's running Dutch text. When I walk away, we can either maintain English subtitles or we can now change from Dutch uh, language to, um, to English language. And then a few seconds later, release the subtitles so that the subtitles could go away unless you have somebody with a hearing problem, in which case you can leave it up. And then when the next person walks up who prefers Spanish, we can continue to run English language because the English person is still looking and we can put Spanish subtitle, subtitles up. So it really is completely down to the programming and the preference um, of the client as to how you would want to use this. It's, ex it's extremely flexible and down to programming um, that really controls the behavior of the system. Perfect. Well, I think that is it for our questions. We'll give it one more second, but I think we are wrapping up at this point. So. Again, I want to um, thank everybody for joining the webinar today for this very high level view, overview of our recognition technology systems. You can find us online at madsystems.com and on our social media platforms, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and uh, YouTube. 
Um, also, please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be up on our sites very, very shortly. We'd like to thank In Park Magazine, Blue Loop, and 16.9 for helping us to promote our events. Be sure to sign up for our next webinars in our AV++ series, including Looking Glass Concierge and our Quicksilver Toolbox, which will include True Check, Lifesaver, Drink Me, Dormouse, and Caterpillar. Also, another webinar that is not part of the series, we will be showing how Matt's preparing um, our workspace um, for us to reopen for a safer environment for a post-COVID world. So stay tuned for the announcement of that as well. Thanks again. Feel free to connect with me online. I'm on Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn, and also via email at brandy at madsystems.com. Take care and stay safe. See you again soon.